Today, inflation number wanging is a thing. Hello again, it's Madison North from Digital Finance Analytics, where well, I'm Dad's post covering finance and property use. Well, continuing with our last post about inflation measurement and the fudging which goes on today, we look at some of those factors which are often excluded from core inflation calculations like oil and rental costs. And we're also going to look at some of the adjustments that are made by the data gnomes as they produce their results, all of which tells us that there is significant number wanging going on, despite which results hit us directly as it informs central bank policy rate decisions. This was recently discussed by John Authors on Bloomberg. Central bank has proposed a look at inflation excluding energy, and this can be explained by looking at this chart because the oil prices are much more volatile than the rest of the index. Oil prices have risen recently thanks to a less violent but major shock the alliance between Saudi Arabia and Russia to try to boost crude oil prices. That has now convinced some Wall Street analysts that Brent crude could reach $150 a barrel. And that's created angst over inflation and a renewed dose of allegations that central banks' emphasis on core inflation, excluding energy, shows that they're trying to distort figures downward or to pretend that energy prices don't matter. Now, those probably aren't very fair criticisms, but they do raise some profound issues. None of this means that higher oil prices don't hurt a lot, because they do. It just means that they shouldn't be allowed necessarily to have too a direct an effect on monetary policy. Some of the most famous central bank errors, such as the European Central Bank's rate hike in the summer of 2008, had actually been driven by an attempt to respond to higher oil prices. So how much will it hurt? Now, on Yom Kippur in 1973, several different Arab nations invaded and sparked the chain of events that led to an oil embargo. And that in turn led to stagflation, both inflation and economic stagnation in the developed world for much of the next decade. But the shock will probably not be as brutal this time around because the developed economies are far less oil intense. It takes up a far smaller share of the economy even when it's expensive. And comparing that to 2008, you can see that the oil at present takes a much smaller bite out of disposable personal income. So even a surge to $150 would leave it short of the mark from the previous round. Now that focuses in on the greater economic impact of more expensive oil, which actually acts a bit like a tax and can force consumers and businesses to reduce their other expenditures. Broader evidence again suggests that this oil spike, while unwelcome, may not be crippling. In fact, Spencer Hill of Goldman Sachs described it as a manageable headwind for three reasons. First, the magnitude of the oil price increase is small relative to history and relative to consumer spending and disposable income growth. The GDP headwind should be partially offset by high energy sector capex and by lower energy prices. And third, the Fed is unlikely to tighten policy in response, especially as core inflation and inflation expectations are falling. Now, followers of geopolitical trends may well remember that the oil price crash of 2014, driven by Saudi Arabia, appeared to be aimed at forcing US shale producers out of business as they require a higher price to be competitive. A return of expensive oil should boost the US economy by sparking more investment. None of this means that more expensive oil won't hurt, because it will, but it's sensible for the Fed to exclude energy costs from its calculation. Now let's turn to a more valid critique of inflation data, focusing in on the treatment of the property market. That's because shelter inflation is at historic extremes. All other items, once shelter is excluded, were last month rising at a year-over-year rate of 1.9% just below the Fed's target. This disparity stems in a large part from the way that rental inflation is calculated. The index is built taking an average of all the leases currently in force. In any one month, most of those used in the calculation won't change. But various private sector groups now produce indices of rents based only on leases taken in the last month. Zillow is perhaps the most widely cited, and it suggests that the peak came in the spring of last year if anything, slightly ahead of the index, excluding shelter. Spikes as sudden 
as the one that followed the pandemic are unusual on this argument, and this has exposed the lag in the rental data that goes into the CPI, and that in turn explains the historic disconnect between shelter and other constituents. Duke University finance professor Campbell Harvey used this chart using data from apartmentlist.com that are in line with the numbers from Zillow to suggest that the current CPI is significantly understated. For Harvey, this is evidence that inflation is much further under control than the Fed realises and that further rate hikes could in fact be damaging. In real time, prices and rents are approximately 1% year over year. Recalculating the CPI based on this more realistic number means inflation is 1.5% year over year. Supposed shelter is running at 2%. This means inflation is running at 1.8% year over year. Both numbers are well below the Fed target. And the Fed chair stated, we want to see convincing evidence, really, that we have reached the appropriate level. I think really that I have presented convincing evidence, he said. Now, if that's a tad overstated, there is a decent evidence from other numbers that the property market has started to cool. Sarah Melink of Nuveen points out a notable cooling off of the US housing market, notably an 11% fall in new home construction in August, driven in large part by a 26% drop in multi-unit housing starts. A shelter currently accounts for a third of the entire increase in the CPI. That suggests that rate cuts could be coming earlier than now expected. And it's possible to overdo this criticism, by the way. The consumer price index exists in large part to provide a base for indexing payments to inflation. For this, the average lease over the previous 12 months makes more sense than just those taken out in the last month. When it comes to guiding central banks, the point is well made. More up-to-date numbers on rents would make inflation look smaller and it decrease the case for higher rates. Now, let's think of another important point. Inflation affects different groups in society differently. As, for example, Fed Deputy Chair Lionel Brainard explained last year. And more important, in recent years, the prices that have been paid by the poor have tended to increase faster, much exacerbating inflation. And COVID also created more inflation for the poor than the rich. Different baskets can capture this, but it's certainly true that one basket of things to buy reflected in the official data cannot possibly reflect the actual cost of living for everyone. Generational divisions also matter. Take college tuition and childcare. In fact, so far this century in the US, inflation in college tuition fees has been greater than daycare costs. 20 years ago, parents of toddlers faced significantly less inflation than for those whose kids were old enough to go to college. Now that's turned around. With staff harder to find, daycare costs have increased sharply, while colleges, which appear to be facing a crisis of public confidence over whether a four-year degree is really worth having, have had to rein in their fees. Maybe for families with several teenage kids, inflation isn't quite as bad as the numbers make it appear, whereas younger parents with toddlers must deal with a sharp increase in their costs, making it much harder to be part of the workforce and meaning that inflation is worse for them than the headline numbers might imply. Both of these things can be and are true at the same time. So does that mean that an overall measure of inflation is a lie? No, not really. In fact, you could look at the official data to accompany the headline numbers and those figures are a reasonably good faith composite of what is made up of the overall living costs. Another problem with inflation perception is rooted in human nature. We notice something that hurts far more than something that is improving. The latter are much easier to take for granted. Housing and food are more expensive than they used to be, which hurts. The cost of healthcare and college education has roared out of control, making life much more uncertain for many and putting a middle class lifestyle further out of reach. Those garner the attention and column inches and pixels of the media, but However, some things have got cheaper. Technology, for example, has made a swathe of electrical goods much less expensive, even as their quantity has improved. What follows here are the official CPI figures for inflation this century for five different categories of electrical goods. They've all grown far cheaper and done so almost constantly. In the case of telephone hardware, calculators and other items, an ungainly heading for an important sector 
prices have fallen literally without a break since the year 2000. These items aren't as essential to life as food, but some are nonetheless close to impossible to do without. Life without a mobile phone would be hard these days, and computers are pretty handy too. In the case of these items, they have grown more important over time, even if they've become cheaper. 30 years ago, didn't have a mobile phone or a laptop, and so there would be no point in including them in my inflation basket. These days, a mobile phone is essential. It is to be part of the inflation basket, and not just for those who make their living in journalism. That leads to a difficult issue, which is hedonic adjustments. Hedonic adjustments, as they are known in the literature, had nothing to do with hedonism. Rather, the concept refers to the fact that products and services don't stay the same over time. Most of them tend to improve. The fair price for many products will increase over time because you get more for your money. Inflation statistics should take account of this, but the question is how to do it. A compelling example at present is the iPhone. Last weekend, the iPhone 15 went on sale at $799 for the most basic model in the US. The first ever iPhone, a much less powerful and capable gadget, was launched in June 2007 at a price of $499. That works out at a 2.99% inflation per annum. If you wanted a splash for the top of the range initial iPhone, it cost $599, a price that has now risen to $1,129, or a 4.04% annual inflation rate. And meanwhile, the headline has averaged 2.44% over that time, while the core has risen by 2.42%, which incidentally does illustrate that the difference between headline and core tends to even out over time. An iPhone 15 is a very different device from a first-generation model. Have smartphones really taken a greater share out of our income since 2007, as the basic figures imply? And how do you compare an inflation basket from before and after 2007? At this point, an iPhone can replace a mobile phone, Blackberry, Palm Pilot, GPS navigation system, mobile television, radio, camera, a library of books, a photo album, credit or debit cards, a Walkman, or Discman, an alarm clock, a stopwatch calculator, and basically a laptop. And of course, it's not only Apple that can do that. Compared to the cost of buying all that lot 20 years ago, the iPhone has driven massive deflation for us all. And there are also some arguments against this. If you can't afford a smartphone, it's harder now than it used to be to choose some of the constituent services that it can perform for you. You might have a GPS system now, but maybe you'll have to be happy to economise with a road atlas. Yet it's a fair position that overall the official inflation data inadequately reflects the ways in which life has grown cheaper over time. Compared to 50 years ago, you can buy so much more stuff for the same share of your income, although it does help if you don't have to pay for your accommodation. Does that mean the data artificially makes inflation look worse over the long term? Well, for the Bureau of Labor Statistics own detailed explanation of how it deals with that, it's worth reading. And here we get quite technical. If prices rise, you might shift from an expensive brand to a cheaper one, which is the relevant price for calculation inflation. Or perhaps price rises in one sector, oil being the topical example, are so great that you stop buying something else altogether. So how should the basket of goods monitored by the statistical authorities be reweighted to account for all of this, if at all? Now this is a long-running debate, and the academic community tends to believe that official numbers are overstated. The last big exploration of the topic came with the so-called Boskin Report of 1996 for the Social Security Administration, and it concluded the inflation then was overstated by 1.2 percentage points. The debate has continued ever since with contributions from the Fed and the European Central Bank and elsewhere. Effectively, it presumes modest consumer substitution within item categories, correcting for what the Botkin report termed as lower level substitution bias. That is, it assumes that consumers will substitute away from one brand or type of item, such as a steak or a car, as that brand or type becomes relatively more expensive compared to other brands or types of that product. It does not assume, however, substitution between steak and chicken or between cars and bus fares. 
substitution bias in itself will tend to overstate inflation by making the assumption that people will buy the same thing no matter how expensive it is relative to competitors you can create the scary indices that purport to show that inflation has been far higher for decades now that says if the bls is overcompensating then it can artificially reduce price increases but the takeout from all of this is that the official statistics relating to inflation are all over the place and there's lots of moving parts and yet despite that the index is used to drive monetary policy and as we've discussed it may well be that different cohorts have different inflation experiences the different people will substitute different alternatives and the net net of all of this is there is no such thing as a national inflation number you can really only take it down to a very granular level and look at it locally now that's an inconvenient truth for central banks who still target core inflation or a trimmed core or whatever it is to try and justify their decisions actually to my mind this whole inflation targeting game is a bit nuts insofar that the numbers are all over the place the strategy is all over the place and there are many other factors i think outside of what we've discussed which can also influence those numbers too so the bottom line is inflation is all about the big number wang i'm martin north from digital finance analytics May thanks for watching and i'll see you again next time 